Amen. Well, before we start, let's uh, have a word of prayer for our Belize mission team as they're ministering today and as a home church, we'll be faithful to lift them up to the Lord. Father, we come to you, Lord, right now. And Father, we thank you that our church, Lord, even at this moment is ministering, Father, to here and uh, abroad in Belize, Father. We pray for our team, Father. We pray for safety. God, you'd put a hedge of protection around them. Continue to use them. God is your instruments, Father. Continue to bless their work, Father. God, we pray for souls to be saved to your kingdom, people to be drawn to you, Father. And God, that there'd be a, just a great harvest of souls. And Lord, open the doors to schools and everywhere else, Father. Bind the enemy, Lord, from any disruption he would try to, to do there, Lord. And we just pray for their ministry the whole week, Lord, and that they'd have safe return and safety while they're there. Lord, we lift this up to you and trust you with it, as well as our service here today, in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen, amen. amen. Well, there was an old farmer that, amen, the Lord's agreeing with that, amen. There, there was an old farmer that just caught all kind of fish, just hundreds, and he was there in the marketplace, and the, and the game warden saw him. And he saw those hundreds of fish, he said, listen, buddy, if you don't show me where you caught them fish, I'm gonna write you up a bunch of tickets. So he said, well, come on, I'll come show you. So they drove out to town, went to this pond. They both got in the boat and headed out to the spot. And the game warden noticed as they were going in his boat, he didn't know it. He noticed in the boat, there was no rods and no reels. Oh man, something's going on here. Well, they get about midway and he said, well, here's the spot. We're ready to fish. And so the farmer got a little box out and took a stick of dynamite and lit it. Waited for a while, throw it out in the water and explosion, boom, and all the fish came to the top. He just started taking them, scooping up, scooping up. Game warden was just frustrated. His mouth was wide open. He said, I can't believe you did this. He said, you broke every rule in the book. He said, I, I could take you to prison. He said, I'm gonna have to fill up my whole pad for what you just did here at this illegal dynamite. And he just went on and on, jabbing and jabbing and jabbing. The old farmer real quietly reached in the toolbox, got another piece of dynamite out, lit it, and put it in the game warden's hand. And it was going down the deal. He said, listen, are you gonna fish or talk? <laughs> so, you know, today we have to make a decision, not fish or talk, but the decision is, what are you going to do with the Lord in your situation? You say, I'm not in a situation. Well, hold on just a minute. You'll be in a situation. We're always either coming in a situation, in a situation, about to go to a situation. And the question always will be in that situation, what are you going to do with the Lord? That's usually not what we think. What am I going to do? But no, what are you going to do with the Lord in this situation? That's how you need to look at it. Good, bad, or indifferent situation. What am I going to do with Jesus? in regard to this situation. And if you've been in our lift studies, we're in 1 Samuel. And so if you're missing lift, you're missing a lot of this good material that's in 1 Samuel. So get plugged into lift. So we're gonna walk through these three chapters, not every verse, but to see it unfold that the Ark of the Covenant, we're gonna see how people handled the Ark of the Covenant. Now the Ark of the Covenant is not God, but it's a symbol of God Amen. in the Old Testament. The Ark was always a symbol of God. And so... This ark goes to these people, some lost, some saved, some Philistines, some Israelites, but what did they do with the ark? How did they handle it? They had all these options that they chose to do once they got the ark, and those options are options that many Christians or even non-Christians do when it comes to the Lord. Not all of them are good options. Matter of fact, they're all bad options except the last one. I'll give you a heads up. But we all, at times, are tempted to do these options with the Lord when we face various situations in our life. Now, a lot of people categorize Christianity. I mean, you can't help it, they just do it. They categorize people like, those are those fanatical Christians. And those are just those regular everyday Christians. But as you look at these options, there's really not really much of an option because all these non-options are really have to, the answer is fanatical Christianity. It's just no place for any other type of answer when it comes to what to do with the Lord. So let's begin to look at this as we see these options that the people face. Option number one is to attempt success apart from God. To attempt success apart from God. Matter of fact, 
the ark had been captured by the Philistines and basically here their first option in trying to attempt success apart from God is to put things in your life that compete with God. It says there in 1 Samuel, then the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it to the house of Dagon and set it by Dagon. Dagon was their, their God. That was their opposite of the Ark of the Covenant. That was symbolic of their God. And they put it, the Ark of the Covenant, symbolic of the true God, next to it. See, the thing that really hurts our walk with the Lord is we put things in our life that are not necessarily evil, but they're in our life and they compete with God. And that's what makes them evil. They can be something holy, righteous, a job, a hobby, an interest, friends, family, career, entertainment. Some of those are fine in and of themselves. There's nothing ungodly about them unless they're ungodly in and of themselves, but just by themselves they're not. But they are when they compete with God. God's in competition with them at times and sometimes God gets bumped over. That's what the Philistines, here's our God, We'll put our God next to his God. You say, well, I don't have other gods, Tim. Anything we put in our life that competes with God and has a higher priority of God is our God. You can say God is your God, but he's not your God if you have other things before God that are more important, you're more in love with, or have a higher priority. The highest priority to the Philistines was their Dagon, and they put the ark of God next to it. So examine your life. Of what competes with your time, talent, and treasures with God? What's in competition with it? Well, a lot of things will always be in competition with, with it, but are they winning? Are those things that are in competition with God actually winning and bumping God down? When he used to be first, and now because of those things you've allowed in your life, God gets bumped down, down, down. I don't have time for him. I don't have money for him. I don't have time. I don't have to time to serve him, I don't have time to come faithfully, I don't have, you know, and he gets bumped down. Well, that's what they were doing here. And then anything you really put before God is going to fail. When the Ashtonites rose early the next morning, behold, Dagon had fallen on his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon and set him in his place again. So what do they do? Well, here's what you put and I put before God. Of course, these were Philistines, but anything we put before God, I believe God's going to see that it fails. And that's for our good, not for our bad. God's saying, don't put anything before me. That's not good for you. Here they thought, well, that's Israel's God. Our God's better than his God, their God. So we'll just put him in there. And God knocks him down. Do you notice how he knocked him down? He knocked him down in a way that when he fell, he faced God, almost like in worship. So you're the, really the true God, not me. Not anything that people would put before you. You're God. I'm going to bow before you. And God knocked it down. That's why God's trying to many times, I believe, knock things down in our life that compete with him. And here it is. Now look at that last verse. They took him and set him up again. Here's a, just a side note, and this is a free one. Uh, don't ever serve a God that you've got to help. That's just a free one right there. If you gotta help him, that's not the God you wanna serve. You don't wanna serve a God who's strong enough to help you. They had to help, oh, come on, they God, let's help you up. Well, if he's such a good God, why did he help himself up? Or why did he fall in the first place? And that's what we do. We, we try to help up our things that are before God. Say, oh gosh, it knocked down again. I guess I have to set it back up. Well, you ought to have seen right there that he wasn't the true God. Also, repeating... What fails is considered insanity. So they tried again, but when they arose early the next morning, behold, Dagon had fallen on his face to the ground before the Lord. Same posture, except this time the head of Dagon and both the palms of his hands were cut off on the threshold. Only the trunk of Dagon was left to him. It's kind of a statue, half fish, half man. Because to them, he was the God, the grain God, the God of fertility, the God who provided what they needed. See, anything that we put in our life that we think is really our provider and not God is our day gone. My job's not my provider. The 401k is not your provider. All that can go. God is your provider. And that's what Dagon was to them, their provider. 
He provides our grain. He's the one we'll depend on. Well, God knocks him down. This time it's even worse. He knocks him down, cuts his head off, cuts his hands off, which to them, they knew what that was symbolic of. The head was control. The hands were power. Your God has no control and no power. Our God has knocked that off. And here he is prostrate. But see how many people I counsel with that we've tried it this way and it's failed. We tried it this way and it's failed. We tried it this way and it's failed. And they keep doing the same thing year after year, month after month, decade after decade, looking for a different result. And it never changes. It's like, how long are you going to keep doing it this way? Till you're dead? If you do the same thing the same way, you're going to get the same results that you always got. Here they did it again. Well, we'll try it again. Let's set him up and find out. Have not only that, it gets worse. That's insanity to keep trying to put things before God and just watching life get more miserable and more frustrated and things don't get answered and your prayers don't get answered and you don't see God working in your life because the, the day gone, you keep putting it back up there and setting it back up there and God keeps knocking it down and you keep setting it back up. I'm gonna do it this way. It's gonna work and I'm gonna make sure it works and it obviously doesn't. And then of course, wait for the negative consequences. And the hand of the Lord was heavy against the Ashenites and he ravaged them and smote them with tumors, both Ashdod and its territories, as if that wasn't enough. God's not gonna handle that. Matter if you study this word, we're not gonna get into detail about it. It has to do with kind of tumors in the lower part of the body. Near the groin is really the true Hebrew translation. Matter of fact, if you look at other translation, they say hemorrhoids. God's got a little sense of humor, doesn't he? He's going to smote them with some pretty good, nice sized ones, probably. But God's message is going to get through. Not only did he say, I'm not going to tolerate this competition, but then he also takes them and has this smoting of these tumors because we've got to realize that God's God and he's not going to tolerate. You know, we think we're really smart. We can figure out life ourselves. It's like the little, uh, there's a plane and up in the plane was a pilot, a nine-year-old boy, a preacher and the smartest man in the world. And the pilot announced, the engine just quit, we're going down. Problem is we got three parachutes and four people. I'm grabbing one because I got a wife and four kids and he jumps out with the first parachute. Smartest man in the world says, look, I'm the smartest man in the world. I can figure out all the world's problems. The world needs me and he grabs the second parachute and jumps out. Preacher grabs the third parachute and says, here son, I've lived a long, good life. I know the Lord Jesus. I look forward to meeting him here. You go ahead and jump out. I'll go down with the plane. The little boy said, hey, don't worry about it, preacher. The smartest man in the world just jumped out with my backpack. <laughs> you know, that's about right. When we think, I, Brother Tim, I can figure out things. I'm not stupid. If A plus B and C, I'll just figure out life and do it as I want to. It'll work out good. You're like that smartest man in the world, you know. You think you are, but you don't make the decisions that God would have us make. And these people thought they could work out things on their own, but they didn't. And it didn't work how they thought it would. Well, what's the second option we have is a believer or a non-believer with God. Well, you can keep your distance between you and God. Of course, you really can't because God's everywhere, but you know what I mean. You try to make a distance. What did they do? Well, the Astonites, they said, this must not remain with us. Let's get rid of him. Let's put a little distance between us and that ark. Well, they send it to Gath and what do the people of Gath do? Well, they got tumors as well. And they said, we can't keep this ark here. Let's send it. So they sent the ark to Ekron. Well, Ekron gets it and they said, well, send it away from us. Send it to Israel, put it in its own place. That's what I see people who don't opt for first option to say, look, I can do success apart from God being God in my life. I'm, or, or I'll do at least put a distance between me and God. See, most people wanna be close enough for God to get help, but far enough from God to not be accountable.
Try that with your cell phone. Be far enough away from a tower, but too far to get reception, and you're not going to like it very well at all. The waves are still there, but your phone's too far away from the wave to get a good signal. You know what I'm saying? You're going to pick up your cell phone in prayer. Maybe you're not going to get that answer. You're too far. You've, you've drifted. And you know, not that it's all not dependent on grace because it is, but you get the deal that we want to be close to God, but if he's going to hold us accountable for living for him, we may see an issue there. So what did these people think the answer was? Just have a little distance. Still be a Christian. Of course, these are lost people, but Christians do this. I can still be a Christian, but I just want to keep my distance, my safe distance. I, those fanatical Christians are a little too much for me. I'll just serve him, but serve him at a distance. And that was option two. How well did that work for him? Not good at all either. Well, what's option number three? We'll just count everything as chance. Just things happen. Case of Ross or Rob, Brother Tim. I mean, that's how life happens. It's all, it could be by chance. So what do they do? They, they get some, some cows who they've took away from their nursing calves and they hook this, these cows to a cart and put the ark on the cart and send the ark off to Israel. And they said, watch, if it goes by the way of its own territory to Beth Shemesh, then he, that's God, has done this great evil. But if not, if the cart doesn't head that way, then they will know that it was not his hand that struck us, but it happened to us. Chance. Just chance. I mean, that's just how it happens, Brother Tim. It's just by chance. Boy, it's amazing. All that, every city got tumors. And the Dagon fell down and broke his head and hands. And they're still saying, well, it still may not be God. It may just be chance. If that cart doesn't go back that way, we'll know it just happened by chance. Look, there's a sovereign God that's in control of everything. And we can't just count things as chance when they're God and evident that it is God. You see how we try to talk our way out? That if we're not right with God and God's trying to get our attention, many times we just say, well, it's not God, it's just chance when it really may be God trying to speak to us through our circumstance and our situation. Fourth option. Fourth option is to take God's commandments lightly. To take them lightly. Okay, now the ark is at Beth Shemesh. And it says, now the people of Beth Shemesh were reaping their wheat harvest in the valley. And they raised their eyes and they, they see that cart coming. They see the ark and we're glad to see it. It's back in Israel. But then in verse 19, something happened. And he, God, struck down the men of Beth Shemesh because they had looked into the ark. And he struck down all the people, 50,070 men, and the people mourned because the Lord had struck the people with a great slaughter. Now, these are God's people. It's back in Israel now. It's not in the hands of the Philistines. It's made its way back home. And they welcome it. It's back. Praise the Lord. But the one bad thing about it is they looked in it. But Brother Tim, the Philistines looked in it and they didn't drop them dead. Look, there's more accountability for God's people who know God's word than it is from the last, the lost who don't know necessarily. I mean, we're all accountable, don't get me wrong. But the children of Israel knew better than to look in that ark and to look what was in it. And 50,000 plus men lost their lives. Well, let's look and see what the word did say. In Numbers, we go back and we say, so they will not touch the holy objects and die. So number one, you couldn't touch them. Numbers 4.20 says, but they shall not go in to see the holy objects, even for a moment, or they will die. Now, I know it doesn't say in the scriptures, but you almost want to see where it would say, what part of don't see, don't touch, don't you get? And I hear people all the time with scripture, but brother Tim, here's what I think that means. Brother Tim, here's how I, I think that ought to be carried out. 
it says don't look at it or don't touch it. I don't know if you remember when King David had the ark. Remember, it's supposed to be carried by poles. And King David decided to put it on a cart too and have it sent. And on the way there, the cart kind of got a little stumbled and we see what happened. This is another story. But when they came to the threshing fold of Nikon, Uzzah reached out toward the ark of God and took hold of it for the oxen nearly upset it. So now here you're going, you're the priest, the ark's going and it hits a bump and, and what happens? The ark gets ready to fall off the cart. You being the priest, you don't want the ark to fall and get hurt. So what do you do? You kind of hold it from falling off. It's no big deal there, is it? That's an excuse, right? And the anger of the Lord burned against Uzzah and the Lord struck him down there for he was irreverent and he died there by the ark. God said, don't touch it. Yeah, but here's a good excuse. God, it's gonna fall, it's gonna break it. I'm your servant. I just wanted to keep it from not falling and hurting. Leave that to me, is what the Lord would say. If I said don't touch it, I mean don't touch it. And if it falls, I'll take care of it because you can't touch it. You can't help it from falling off. But he didn't. His intentions were good, but he died just the same because the rule is don't touch it. And a lot of people, their option is, I know what God's word says, but let's don't take it so seriously. Let's just take it lightly. And that's what they did. I'm sure they said, the ark's back. Let's praise the Lord. Look in it. And then they died. Option number four should not be taken lightly because the Lord has commands and they're to our benefit, not our demise. Option number five is mistake partial obedience to God for obedience. But partial obedience is disobedience. Isn't it that way with your children? If they partly obey and partly disobey, you put that under the category of disobedience. For the day the ark remained at Chris Jurium, the time was long, 20 years. 20 years it stayed there. They still didn't get right. Verse three, Samuel spoke to all the house of Israel saying, if you, pay close attention to those words, if you. See, he's about to make a stipulation that if you do this, I'll do this. The Lord's saying, if you'll do these things I'm on list, then I'm gonna do something for you. Let's look at what they were because they weren't fully obedient to the Lord. Most people's life is not in major disobedience. It's in partial disobedience or what they would classify it. It's really full disobedience. But if you ask them, they'd say, well, it's just partially disobedient. So let's look. First of all, Samuel says, return to the Lord with all your heart. What does that mean? Their heart wasn't all in. <laughs> is your heart all in? Now, I've been hearing that phrase sometimes, people that come and know the Lord using that phrase, said, I got saved, I'm all in. <laughs> that sounds pretty cool. Hey, I'm all in. These people weren't all in. They were partly in. Why? Because he said, with all your heart, as opposed to just saying, well, return to the Lord. No, return to the Lord. Be, put your whole heart into it. Don't just be partly in. And remove the foreign gods and the astral from among you. What was that? Well, they weren't all in because they kept a mix. They said, we love God, but we've got our own little thing going over here that really we love better or as much as God. So we're gonna keep our other gods. The other things that we like, I mean, we can't get too fanatical about serving Jesus. You know, we gotta have this other stuff that's as important as he is. And then what he says, and direct your hearts to the Lord. What did that say? Well, their love was directed elsewhere. Otherwise, they wouldn't have to redirect to the Lord. Partial obedience. I'm sure it was partly directed to him, but partly directed to other things as well. And serve him alone. Not with all that other gods, not with all that half-heartedness, but serve him alone. Which they didn't prioritize God. They didn't serve God as God. 
So he said, if you'll do these four things, oh, the next three words, and he will. He'll what? He'll deliver you from the hand of the Philistines. It's been giving you these heartaches, headaches. They've been attacking you and destroying you and making your life miserable. And if you'll do these things, I'll deliver them out of your hand. Now, let me ask you this. What if the people at, at Karim Jerium were praying, Lord, deliver us from these Philistines? Would it have happened? I don't think so. He told them what to make it happen. <laughs> he, he, he gave them. He, he didn't, I mean, prayer is important. Don't, don't misunderstand me because it is. He told them what to do. Return to the Lord with all your heart. Remove those gods. Direct your hearts toward me and serve me alone and I'll get rid of them. People are looking for deliverance from all these things and he gives a formula right here. If you want them delivered, if you'll, boom, 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 then I will. Well, those are some important words in the Bible. Mark it down. If you, he will. If you, he will. If you, he will. And that's a promise. Brother Tim, I don't want to use that formula. I'll just keep on just praying. Well, keep on praying. I'm not saying don't stop praying, but pray and do that. Because he's promised, if you will, I will. And I want deliverance. I don't know about you. I don't, I don't have Philistines around me, but I got stuff sometimes that's like Philistines. I'd like some deliverance. I don't want Philistines messing my stuff up and messing my crops up and messing my finances up, messing my relationships up, and messing my stuff up. I don't want them. I want them gone. If you want to live with them, have at it. But I don't want any Philistines around me. The Lord said, if you will, I will. I'm saying, Lord, let's go. Let's get rid of them pesty things. Let's send some termite exterminators and take care of us. And he did because he keeps his promise. And then option number six, which is really the only good option, is repent and serve God as God. So the sons of Israel removed the Baals and the Ashtoreth and served the Lord alone. Oh, isn't it good to have a good ending? They did it. And he did it. <laughs> isn't that much better to live life like that. Just do what the Lord said. Let him handle those things that we can't handle. Because that's what a lot of life is. I deal with people that say, what do I do? And I say, you can't do anything. This is a God thing. I mean, you can do these four things, but you've got to let God just give God the platform to do that. You do what he says and let him handle the rest. Because it's a God thing. You can't muster enough stuff to do God things or you'd be God. Let God handle it, but do your four things. You will, he will. And so they did. And so we'll just take him at his word and serve him alone. Do you notice this theme, serve alone, was mentioned in the previous verses? It's mentioned here. It's really mentioned through this whole story. That's what the Dagon issue was about. It's God plus Dagon. <laughs> it's God plus Astaroth. It's God plus Baal. It's God plus not your whole heart. It was always something in competition with God. And all God's saying is, I want to be alone in this. I said, Brother Tim, that's a little too fanatical. Well, let's see if it's too fanatical for your wife to say, you know what? Being married to you alone is a little too fanatical. So I'd like to introduce you to my three new girlfriends. Sally, Susie and Betty, because it's a little too fanatical for you to think that I should serve you alone and not have any other fun. And these, are, I'd like to introduce you to my three friends. Well, she may introduce you to three friends too, Glock, Remington, and Winchester, you know. <laughs> she said, I'd like to introduce you to a few things, you know. She may come loaded. Why? Because... It doesn't seem fanatical when it's you and your relationship with the other person, does it? You kind of like the word alone, like just me and nobody else, and you don't say that's fanatical. But when it comes to God, why is it any different with him to want the same kind of relationship? Just me. Just like you have your marriage relationship, just you and you don't want anybody else. I don't want anybody else. 
I want to be served alone. And so what do they do? When verse 6, they're gathered at Mishpah and they drew water and they poured it out before the Lord and fasted that day and said, we've sinned against the Lord. Pouring out water on the ground was just a sign of repentance. I'm nothing. This water is me and without you, God, I just like water poured on the ground. What can you do with water poured on the ground? Nothing. It's just all mud and you can't get it back in the jar. Just, I repent. I'm nothing without you. I'm just poured out. Lord, just, I'm here. I want to be right with you. I want to serve you. They, they truly did repent. That's true repentance, to pour yourself out and say, okay, God, I mean business. I'm emptied. There's nothing left of me. It's all going to be you. And boy, what a beautiful picture of a symbolic repentance, pouring out water. I think that'd be good that if you really did repent, you know, maybe at church, we don't want to mess up all the carpet. Just go home, get a good pitcher of water, say, Lord, this is me. Just pour down, and that's just, it's going to make mud and nothing else, but I'm just nothing without you. Fill me with all that you. You know, but to most people, that takes risk to say, you know, to fanatically give up things that I like, to fanatically make these new commitments that I make in life, Lord. I mean, you may, when you're talking to the Lord, it may seem like a risk. Like maybe you're giving up too much. Maybe it's just too much. I close with this. In 1856, there was a slave in Virginia named Henry Brown. And you know, Virginia was a slave state. And Henry Brown wanted so much to be free that he got a wooden crate and he postmarked, he, he put the address for the crate to an abolitionist in Philadelphia that he had heard about would take slaves in because that's a free state there in Philadelphia. And so what he did, he got in the crate and sealed it from the inside and mailed himself to Philadelphia three weeks to get there. And the abolitionist broke open the crate, didn't know what was in it, and out pops Henry Brown. And he said, my name's Henry Brown, I'm a slave. And I heard you're an abolitionist and I trust my future to you. He's free. But listen, Henry Brown wanted so much to be delivered from his bondage. He risked a three-week journey. He risked being discovered, and his life would have been much worse. He risked not enough oxygen in that crate. He risked not enough food to sustain him till he got there. But he took the risk. Because he heard of a man, he read of a man that he had never met before, that he would entrust and believe that if he could get there, this man would open that crate, set him free, and he'd live the rest of his life in freedom. And it was worth the risk. Amen. You see, I really don't risk when I turn my life over to the Lord who I've read about and heard and lived for. I don't really risk when I say, Lord, I'm going to put it in your hands. I'm going to let you take care of this situation. I'm going to trust you with it. I don't know all the answers. I don't know the future. I don't know what's going to happen. All that's oblivious to me, but I can trust you with this. No matter what happens, even if things change for the negative, I'm still going to trust you in this because I'm walking out by faith and trusting you alone. Henry Brown did it and he's glad he did. He took the risk. He stepped out when his risk was a greater risk than what ours is because we have a God that we know for sure will come through. Amen. He was taking his chance. Will this abolitionist really be telling the truth? Praise the Lord, his abolitionist did and our abolitionist who sets us free does too and more so. He's never lied once. He's always faithful. You can trust him in the situation that you find yourself in. I love this quote from the book we're using in Lyft, Warren Wisby. God still gives his best to those who leave the choice to him. See, the problem is we make the choice 
and we ask God to bless it. The way we do as a Christian is to say, God, I'm not going to make this choice because I don't know what choice I ought to make. Lord, what choice do you want me to make? That's the choice I'm going to make. And then God blesses that choice. Instead of us going out, making our own choices and saying, God, why aren't you blessing this? <laughs> you see why he doesn't bless him? He blesses his choices. That's why we put all of our choices in his hands and let him bless his choices instead of trying to manipulate him to bless our choices. So what's the only good option when we have a decision? Just repent, let God be God. Let God be God alone and leave the choice to him and be willing to take whatever risk you think there may be Say, I don't know how this is going to turn out. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what's, what's next. What could happen? What's, what? I don't know. Trust God and let it be his best. And let him come through as God. Because I don't want to live in that crate. I want to be busted open and live on the free side where God intended me to live. And you as well. Because he's God. With every head bowed and every eye closed as you stand to your feet.